Hello, all you big, beautiful brains out there. Today, we're going to talk about projective tests. Before we get started, take a minute to subscribe to Psy vs. Psy. Help out your friendly neighborhood psychologist while I tell you all about projective tests. When most of us think of personality tests, we think of survey tests. Things like the MMPI, the MBTI, the Big Five, those are all self-report questionnaires, which means they rely on self-assessments to get their data. But people aren't always the best at accurately knowing themselves. When psychologists are looking at complicated things, like say, your personality traits, that are likely to radically differ between individuals, it helps to have more than one way to assess or measure that thing. So, how can you assess someone's personality without directly asking them? Enter projective tests. Unlike self-assessment methods, which most of us would call surveys, projective tests don't ask participants direct questions. Instead, participants are given an ambiguous stimulus to which they must respond. The responses that are given can then be compared to previous responses from other participants to gain further insight into the personality of that participant or the issues that might be impacting them. For these kinds of tests, studies of many participants have shown common patterns in the answers. According to those who use them, projective tests can reveal things like intelligence, social needs, depression, emotional stability, defensiveness, and more to the properly trained assessor. Since projective tests utilize ambiguous stimuli, the participant is able to project their own thoughts, emotions, and personality onto that stimulus, which is how projective tests get their names. The ambiguousness of the stimulus is kind of like the psychological version of asking someone an open-ended question. So, while in a survey, you might be asked, how happy are you on the average day? And then, given a scale from 1 to 5, with 1 being not that happy at all, and 5 being happy all day. In a projective test, you'd be asked, on an average day, I am happy when I... And then you're left to finish the rest of the sentence on your own. Leaving questions open in this way can lead to finding information that just couldn't be found with survey measures. That's a huge advantage to using projective tests. Another big advantage is the variety of ambiguous stimuli that you can present to a participant. The one I just described, where the participant completes the rest of a sentence with their own thoughts and feelings, is called the Rotter Incomplete Sentence Blank. Far and away, the most common projective tests are the Rorschach inkblot and the thematic apperception test, both of which are probably deserving of their own independent video. But other types of projective tests do exist. For instance, drawing a picture in response to a minimal prompt, or word association tasks where you say a word in response to a stimulus word. But even though they could provide insight in ways that other assessments can't, that doesn't mean projective tests don't have their drawbacks. For one, the interpretation that must be done on projective tests makes them much more time consuming and you need to be a specialized and highly trained individual in order to interpret the results. Remember, it's not just a survey where you can bubble in a multiple choice answer on a computer. Projective tests are usually administered on a one-on-one -on -one basis and are scored by psychological professionals. That takes time and, frankly, quite a bit of money to pay someone to do it. This need for interpretation brings us to another big problem, consistency. While some tests, like the Rorschach inkblot test and the thematic apperception test, do have standard methods of interpretation, there are many others where the interpretation of the data collected is left up to the assessor. Even though they are highly trained psychological professionals, they are still people, and they can interpret things incorrectly, or maybe miss details which could impact the results. So, this criticism is well-founded, and it should be something that is reviewed when delivering the results of this type of non-standardized test. The other big criticism of projective tests is their validity. Validity refers to the accuracy of a measure, 
So how much does a test measure what it claims to measure? Some projective tests are an attempt to explore areas that are extremely difficult to assess, such as subconscious content or traumatic experiences. So exploring those issues could easily lead to accidentally measuring something else, like a person's current mood or recent experiences. For instance, in the house tree person test, where a person is asked to draw all three of those things, it's been heavily criticized for its validity in some populations, but is supported for use in other populations. These criticisms are serious, and maybe the non-standardized assessments should begin to use the term projective tool rather than projective test. But it's no surprise that the usefulness of projective tests has won out in the clinical world. The truth is, Many clinicians find projective tests to be useful as just one part of their diagnostic process. Projective tests and the data you can explore with them is information that can't usually be found through survey measures. So don't be surprised if you find yourself taking or giving a projective test someday. If you want to know more about some of the kinds of projective tests, leave me a comment down below and tell me which one you want to hear about. Or if you want to learn more about the survey measures of personality, make sure you subscribe to Psy vs. Psy so you can get all of our other videos and you can learn all about the science of psychology. Until next time, keep thinking, and I'll see y'all later. Bye! So we talked about projective tests today and I drew this example of the house tree person test. Did you draw one? I think I may have taken this a little too literally. 